Section 10 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McKilwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. Part 3. 2 participation it would be rash to say that the principle underlying the participation of the various classes represented in the english parliament came entirely from feudalism there are precedents in rome and precedents in england and on the continent after the fall of the roman empire of quite another kind but these came to the men of the later middle ages through a feudal channel to put it in another way feudalism is the stage through which english institutions had passed and were still passing at the time when the common law was forming and the functions of parliament developing and the participation of the estates in legislation can no more be understood without taking this into account than can the existence of these estates themselves behind them all lies the courier of the lord in which the laws of the fief are found and applied by all the tenants who owe suit there and have the corresponding right to be tried only by the pares curtis the court of the king was the curia regis and the laws found there by its suitors were the lex terrae but while tenants in chief alone might find those laws they had not made them for a long time the barons were able to make good their claim that they were the populace and through that fiction might alone interpret and enforce the law but this fiction never destroyed the underlying theory that law was approved consensu omnium utentium and just so soon as other classes became strong enough they asserted their right to assent to enactments affecting themselves precedents might be found as early as the preamble to alfred's laws and the indefinite right of the people to ratify the election of a king as it appears in the norman period a right to be traced back no doubt to much the same origin as the similar procedure in the choice of the popes before the constitution of the papacy was definitely formed but it seems best to go back no further than the thirteenth century a beginning might be made with the clear statement of bracton who mentions the leges anglicanae et consuetudines quae quidem cum fuerint approbatae consensu utentium et sacramento regum confirmatae mutare non poterunt nec destrui sine communi consensu et concilio eorum omnium quorum concilio et consensu fuerunt promulgatae enactment and interpretation by the king and his courier are permissible without this concilium omnium since they do not destroy but only improve the law in melius tamen converti possunt etiam sine eorum consensu quia non destruitur quod in melius commutatur so also things noa et inconsueta et quae prius usitata non fuerint in regno si tamen similia e venerint per simile judicentur si autem talia nunquam prius e venerint et obscurum et difficile sit eorum judicium tunc ponantur judicia in respectum usque ad magnum curiam ut ibi per concilium curiae terminentur when however anything is enacted it is communi consensu omnium in theory even though not in fact we know that the barons alone enacted what bracton calls quidam constitutio quidicitur constitutio de merton yet he says one of its articles provisum est et concessum ab omnibus 
the sentence of excommunication pronounced in 1253 against violators of Magna Carta, or the liberties of the Church, well antiquas regni consuetudines approbatas, is followed by a ratification under the seal of the king and certain magnates, concluding with a warning that if any additions are made to the document, dominus rex et predicti magnates omnes et communitas populi protestantur publicae quod in ea nunquam consensurunt nec consentiunt set de plano eis contradicunt it seems pertinent in this connection also to refer again to the form of the coronation oath which seems to date from thirteen o seven under which the king promised to hold protect and strengthen the just laws and customs quas vulgus elegerit the word vulgus was not used by accident nor elegerit either the consensus omnium includes theirs in theory at least even though it be often merely the tacit assent to immemorial custom participation in grants need not detain us the word consuetudines customs had in the middle ages as it has now a double meaning and undoubtedly it was the desire for a larger participation in grants rather than in enactments that led to the application by edward i to the magnum concilium in larger measure than before of the old principle that what touches all should be approved by all the vindication of the right of consent to grants was understood and is understood now for participation in legislation more proof is needed but fortunately it exists for example in thirteen sixty four the rolls of parliament refer to certain good purveyances and ordinances passed with assent of duc comte baron noble et commune et tous autres que la chose touche some of these are referred to later in the roll as a statue in thirteen fifty four the commons complain of the ordinance of the staple lately passed in the council at westminster they insist that such matters can be determined only in parliament because they really concern the king and all his people they declare that they have inspected these provisions et qu'elles leur semblèrent bonnes et profitables pour notre seigneur le roi et tout son peuple soit affirmé en ce parlement et tenu par les statues à durer pour toujours à quelle prière le roi et tous les grands s'accordent unement et saint toutefois que si rien soit ajouté soit ajoute ou que rien soit ajouté soit ajouté en parlement quelle heure que métier en sera et ne mis en autre manière in thirteen sixty three the rolls say et y saint le parlement continue sur traité de divers choses touchant si bien les pétitions baillées par les communes et autres singuliers persons comme les besoignes du roi et son royaume in thirteen seventy one the commons recite the statute ordering que nulle justice par mandement de grand ou privé seal ne laissera de faire commune loi et droit au parti and pray that it be observed and que par commandement du roi ne priez des gens privés notre la commune loi ne soit délayée ni bestournée in the fifty-first regnal year of edward the third the commons petition not to be bound by any statute or ordinance made without their consent and that statutes made in parliament be annulled only there et ceux de commun assent du parlement they pray more especially that they be not bound by any statute or ordinance granted on petition of the clergy to which they have not consented ne que vos dites communes ne soient obligés par nulle constitution qu'ils sont pour leur avantage sans assent de vos dites communes car eux ne veuillent être obligés à nul de vos statuts ni ordinances faits sans leur assent the response is soit cette matière déclare en especial 
probably because it might be a nice question whether the matters objected to were not really things which touched only the clergy rather than tout son peuple and therefore such as might rightly be determined without the commons assent in the midst of the troubles of the year thirteen eighty one an interesting entry is found in the rolls of parliament the chancellor en plein parlement asks the opinion de tous il est on the repeal of the manumission recently granted to the serfs to which the lords spiritual and temporal the knights citizens and burghers responded with one voice in favour of the repeal ajoutant que telle manumission ou franchise des naïfs ne ne peut être fait sans leur assent qu'on le grandra intéresse eight years later the commons petitioned that neither the chancellor nor the council after the dissolution of parliament should make any ordinance en contre la commune loi ni les anciens coutumes de la terre et les statuts devant ses heures ordonnées ou à ordonner en ce présent parlement un scorche la commune loi à tout le peuple universel the proclamations for the publication of statutes or of magna carta and the pronunciationes and petitions in parliament also furnish considerable general evidence on this point in all these the matters upon which the whole parliament has acted are expressly stated to be articles pour le commun profit du peuple et du royaume as in the royal proclamation of the confirmation of magna carta in twelve ninety seven or a grant à son peuple pour le prix de son royaume in the articuli super cartas of thirteen hundred so a mandate to the justice of chester in twelve seventy five orders him to publish in chester certain provisions and statutes enacted by the magnates for the good of the realm and for the relief of the people such expressions are common later in the pronunciation du parlement but they are not found after edward the second's reign in cases where the commons have not assented for example in thirteen fifty one there is mention made of les statuts faits pour amendement des lois de la terre et du peuple in thirteen seventy eight of the good laws and customs of the realm in thirteen ninety seven loi juste et honnête universellement par que si bien les grands comme les petits dus être gouvernés the king wishes to know if any of his subjects have been hindered in obtaining remedies par la commune loi et sur s'être conseillé par tous les états du parlement et en faire bonne et du remède en ce présent parlement in fourteen fourteen the king desires the preservation of les bonnes lois de sa terre and also asks parliament pour faire autre loi de nouvelle à l'aise et profit de ses lieges the language is somewhat different from what would have been thought of a century earlier but the principle is the same the petitions of the commons like the pronunciationes in the king's name seem to make this distinction also in thirteen forty one the commons pray for the observance of magna carta and des autres ordinances et statuts faits pour profit du commun peuple entendant les points de la dite chartre ensemblement ou les autres perpetuellement à durer again in thirteen sixty eight they petition for the maintenance of the charters et tous les statuts faits devant ces heures pour profit de la commune the next year they asked that the statutes be maintained si bien les statuts de la forêt comme tous autres statuts les queues doivent suffire à bon gouvernement s'ils soient bien gardés very important is the careful answer of the archbishop of canterbury in thirteen ninety nine to the prayer of the commons to be excused from taking part in the judgments of parliament it is true he says as the commons have set forth that they need not take part in parliament's actions 
sauf qu'en est statue à faire ou en grande et subside ou telle chose à faire pour qu'en un profit du royaume le roi veut avoir spécialement leur avis et à son this evidence of the necessity for the advice of the commons on matters pour commun profit is supplemented by proof of the converse that matters which were clearly not of this character which affected particular classes only needed no ratification by the commons to make them binding law for those whom they did affect so we find a regulation of the exception of nefty by le conseil en parlement in thirteen forty seven and an accord in thirteen thirty one by which the lords agree que nul grand de terre will aid any robber but give aid to the justices in punishing them in the fifty-first regnal year of edward the third to a request of the commons for an ordinance regarding foreign merchants the king answers that he and the magnates will consider and ordain what is best matters specially affecting the clergy are among the most valuable on this point in thirteen eighty nine the two archbishops made a protestation in full parliament that they do not assent to any statute of that parliament nunc noviter e dito nec antiquo pretenso inuato which is in restriction of potestas apostolica or the liberties of the church in thirteen ninety seven the prelates protest that they cannot assent to any enactment of the king or the temporal lords touching the rights of the pope there is no mention of the commons the commons had in fact petitioned that the king would with the advice of such sages and worthies as he pleased at the next parliament ordain such changes in the statute of provisors as seemed reasonable and profitable in their discretion in the same year a committee of parliament consisting of lords and knights but commissioned par vertu et autorité du parlement de la sang des seigneurs spirituels et temporels annulled the duke of hereford's patent in fourteen thirty three the commons prayed for a modification of the statute of the staple of calais and were answered that it should be done as they desired savons tout fois au roi père et autorité de modifier même le statut qu'on lui plaira par avis de son conseil selon ce que mieux lui semblera pour le profit du roi et du royaume three varieties of parliamentary enactment enactments of parliament are referred to in contemporary official records under various names provisiones établissement stabilimenta constituones accords awards ordinationes statuta and a number of others most of the treatment of the points vital to this paper may be included however under the last two of these and that treatment need not be very long after the many excellent discussions of this subject from the seventeenth century to the present footnote see among others fourth institute prin irenacus redi vivus animadversions on coke's fourth institute whitelock notes upon the king's writ roughhead's preface to his edition of the statutes introduction by the commissioners to the statutes of the realm also reprinted in cooper's public records hargrave and butler's notes to coke on littleton amos's notes to fortescue's de laudibus legum angliae gneist english constitutional history english translation maitland constitutional history hatchek englisches staatsrecht anson law and custom of the constitution fourth edition End footnote. the treatises referred to above quote or cite most of the important precedents in the rolls of parliament and it would therefore be useless to give here more than a few of these in thirteen twenty four was passed the statute concerning the lands of the templars which was afterwards objected to as against law the statute was made by the king and magnates only but it was declared to be concordatum provisum et statutum pro lege in hac parte perpetuo duratura 
Two years later, the king replied to a petition of the commons that certain ordinances should be viewed and examined, et les bonnes soient mises en estatut, et les autres soient ouste. The statute of purveyors, passed by the king, lords, and commons, is followed by five additional articles, which are to be in force without change until the next parliament. Just following these articles, there is a note on the statute roll, et memorandum quod in parliamento predicto concordatum fuit quod articuli predicti non tenerentur pro statuto probably the most conclusive entry in the rolls of parliament occurs in thirteen forty where a committee is chosen consisting of knights and burgesses as well as lords who are instructed to look over the records of that parliament from day to day and cause mettre en estatut les points et les articles que sont perpétuels lequel est statut notre seigneur le roi par assent et tous en dit parlement estant commanda d'en grosser et en sceller et fermement garder par tout le royaume d'angleterre et sur les points et articles qui ne sont mis perpétuels uns pour un temps si à notre seigneur le roi par assent des grands et communes fait faire et ensiler ses lettres patentes in the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third an interesting case occurs apparently the previous petitions of parliament had been assented to but not authenticated as statutes by the great seal now as a condition of the payment of an instalment of a previous grant the demand is made that these be affirmed as granted by the king c'est à savoir les points à durer par estatut et les autres par chartre ou patent et livrés au chevalier des comtés sans rien payer the word ordinance does not occur in thirteen forty four the commons pray that the provisions ordinances and accords made in a previous parliament soit affirmé par estatut perpetuellement à durer in thirteen forty seven they petition that a provision already agreed on in council without delay be made selon la forme de l'estatut and the king promises that that article and the points contained in it soit tenu et gardé en tout point selon la forme de statut en fait the statute of provisors in thirteen fifty cites edward the first's statute of carlisle lequel statut tient toujours sa force a perfectly clear instance is found in thirteen fifty four william de charachel the chief justice announces among the causes of the summons the permanent fixing of the staple the council had made certain provisions or ordinances which had been published throughout the realm and that council had included prelates lords justices sergeants and others of the commune but now pour ce que notre seigneur le roi et les autres si bien grands comme commune qui lors était au dit conseil verrait que la dite estable se tendrait et durait perpétuellement et royaume et terre avant dit si à même notre seigneur fait son mandre son parlement à ce jour de lundi au fin que les ordonnances de la dite étable soient récitées en même le parlement et si rien soit à ajuster qu'il soit à juste et soit à durer perpétuellement comme est statut en parlement another case equally important is found in the first regnal year of richard the second the commons in that year prayed the king that the petitions of the recent parliament which were pour profit de son peuple no doubt to distinguish them from the bills presented by individuals should be now shown to the commons and that such as had been assented to in the form le roi le veut soit affirmé pour estatut ce qui dit aux communes touchant parti des dites petitions que ce ne fuit qu'ordonnance et ne mis estatut 
que ceux puissent être vués et rehaussés ou communes, et ceux qui raisonnable est que y soient ordonnés pour estatut. The next year the commons pray that bills of private persons receive no response, but that their own petitions be answered, a remedy ordained before the dissolution of the parliament, and upon that, et sur ce, du estatut soit fait en ce présent parlement, et on s'il est à demeurer en tout temps à venir. In the third year of the same reign, the commons petition that an existing ordinance soit mise en estatut, en affirmance du sel, and the king replied, soit même l'ordonnance tenue et gardée pour estatut. In 1399, mention is made of certain statutes, que semper ligarent donec auctoritate alicuius alterius parliamenti furent specialiter revocata. Many instances might be given to show that this distinction between statute and ordinance, apparently perfectly clear as to form at least in the time of Edward III, was becoming much less so in the 15th century. These illustrations seem to show that there was a double difference between a statute and an ordinance, a difference in subject matter and one of form and effect. Statutes were in the beginning affirmances of the ancient law. Other kinds of enactment were employed for temporary administrative measures. At the opening of Parliament, the whole body of the ancient customary law together with the two charters and all previous statutes, was affirmed or confirmed. This was on the analogy of the earlier declarations of the king's peace at the opening of a reign, and it is the nearest approach medieval England shows toward a fundamental law. Before the days of modern written constitutions, this was the most authoritative way in which a fundamental law could be promulgated. After the affirmants came, as indicated in the pronunciationes, the removal of abuses or of enactments contrary to or impeding the execution of this fundamental law, and the enactment of legislation supplemental to it which might be of sufficient importance to be classed with that law itself, and therefore put into a statute or statutes. As we have seen, one of the chief characteristics of the law so affirmed, interpreted, cleared or improved is its permanence. And the instances given above show clearly enough that the test of a statute is the question whether the enactment made by it is really incorporated into this law, along with it, perpetuellement à durée, and to be affirmed along with it in all subsequent parliaments. The inference is clear, then, that in the beginning probably all statutes were of this kind. But composed as they were of such subject matter, it is evident that their enactment is more important than other acts of a parliament. As such, they required a different mode of authentication than less important acts. They were sealed with the great seal, and engrossed upon the statute roll as a part of the permanent law, after which they were sent to the chancery and the courts of the two benches, and also to Ireland and elsewhere in cases where this was necessary. Copies were also sent to the sheriffs of the counties, ordering their proclamation, preservation and enforcement within the counties. This authentication was in the hands of the council, consisting largely of the judges, or in special cases of a committee, who went over the Parliament roll during or after the Parliament, which led to many omissions and some changes and additions, sometimes complained of by the Commons. Ordinances originally, as temporary law, were not affirmed generally at the opening of Parliament, as the Charters, Ancient Law and previous statutes were. They also required a less formal mode of authentication than statutes. Without a formal engrossment, they could be taken by the council as the basis for royal writs, charters or letters patent, by which they were published and their enforcement secured.
as time went on the distinction between the subject matter of statutes and of ordinances became less marked the difference came to be regarded more as a difference of form though the real distinction did not disappear until the fifteenth century thus in case of an enactment such as the ordinance concerning apparel in the thirty-seventh regnal year of edward the third where the subject was new there might be a question whether this was fundamental or not and the parliament was asked whether it preferred the form of a statute or of an ordinance s'il voulait avoir les choses saints accordées mis par voie de ordinance ou de statut they answered that they preferred the form of an ordinance in order that it might be changed if necessary at the next parliament in the fifteenth century the distinction seems to be largely disregarded as temporary acts are termed indifferently statutes or ordinances in the half-century embraced by the reign of edward the third however when the original distinction is still clearly preserved there seems no doubt that a perfectly well understood difference existed between a statute perpetuellement à durée and an ordinance pour un temps it would hardly have been necessary to enlarge so much on this point but for the evident confusion existing even in the minds of the latest writers on this important subject thus sir william anson says the ordinance quote, is an act of the king or of the king in council it is temporary and is revocable by the king or the king in council the statute is the act of the crown lords and commons it is engrossed on the statute roll it is meant to be a permanent addition to the law of the land it can only be revoked by the same body that made it and in the same form End quote. he proceeds to prove this by an entry from the roll of thirteen forty which is certainly the clearest statement of the real difference to be found in the rolls of parliament but an examination of it shows and this is corroborated by dozens of other instances that the ordinances in this case as well as the statutes were assented to by king lords and commons it proves his statement that the statutes were permanent law and the ordinances temporary provisions it expressly contradicts his other assertion that an ordinance is necessarily quote, an act of the king or of the king in council in distinction from a statute to which the commons assent must be added it is said in the excellent preface to roughhead's edition of the statutes that the real difference between the subject matter proper to a statute and to an ordinance lies in the distinction between ancient law and nouvelle loi which is undoubtedly true but i think hardly in the sense in which roughhead meant it he says many acts were not entered upon the statute roll quote, for if the bill did not demand nouvelle loi that is if the provision required would stand with the laws in force and did not tend to change or alter any statute then in being in such case the law was complete by the royal assent on the parliament roll without any entry on the statute roll and such bills were usually termed ordinances End quote. But the term nouvelle loi, as used in the rolls themselves and in the yearbooks of the time, does not seem to mean new law so much as new enactment. Acts in affirmance are continually spoken of as nouvelle loi in distinction to the ancient law lying behind it. And while the rest of his statement seems to be completely supported by the rolls themselves, this assertion and his inference based upon it seem to go too far. End of section 10